Hi, software engineers. Coming to you live from beautiful downtown Charlottesville, Virginia. Or my green screen cave, as the case still is. Ain't it great? I see Sal's Italian Cafe right about there. Really good chicken parm. I could go for that right now. Mm. Anyway, last video we talked about plan-driven methodologies. So now we're going to get into Agile. So Agile is actually relatively new comparative to plan-driven. The idea of waterfall and the, the five phases of development, requirements, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance has been around, has been around. And so it started off by we need to have those careful plans. But really with the internet boom, that's when Agile really started to happen because the desire to have something to market as fast as possible, where if you got 80% of the requirements right, that was good. If it didn't, you know, work exactly right at the very beginning, that was okay because we were kind of in a just rush to market sort of mentality. And also, the, this is software that didn't really matter, right? This is software that, I mean, it mattered from a business perspective, but it, it you you still weren't rushing to market your pacemaker software. You were you were trying to be the first to do something really cool on the internet. You were trying to be the first person to do something uh, really cool eventually on mobile devices. So the agile spirit really came out of that um, that entrepreneurship that that excitement for doing new things with computing that we still see today. Um, plan driven absolutely still has its place. Plan driven is absolutely necessary for some of the core software that we use on a daily basis that keeps us safe, that, that, you know, that, that runs our, runs our infrastructure. But, you know, the game you've been playing on uh, your mobile device prop, you know, there's a good chance it probably was more in an agile methodology. So where, what does it mean to be agile? Well, let's go straight to the source. Back in February 20, in 2001 in Snowbird, Utah, for some reason, lots of computer science things happened in Snowbird, Utah. There's like a, there's an annual conference of department chairs there. And go figure. Anyway, a bunch of folks got together and they wrote this. The Manifesto for Agile Software Development, which admittedly sounds like something they would try to publish anonymously in like the New York Times or something like that. But regardless of the naming, let's see what they're saying. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others doing it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left. Dramatic reading aside, what are they trying to say here? It, it, it is kind of a shot across the bow at the core ideas of what plan driven is, right? The idea of we have a process, we have tools, we need to follow these processes and tools to make sure that we're building the software correctly as we're moving forward. I mean, it just kind of make, I mean, that, that, that's what plan driven is about. And it's incredibly important to think that way when you're building safety critical software. But if you're building Grandma Rachel's recipe extravaganza website do you really need all those things or are you creating additional overhead additional bureaucracy that is that is keeping you from the needs of the customer i mean you you kind of see the, the 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 mentality going on here it's like let's cut out the middleman let's cut out the bureaucracy let's get down to the to the heart of the matter and let's build that solution and okay, sure, from a, you know, tongue-in-cheek sort of perspective, that, that works for some software that you're building. Not all of it, though, but for some it does. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Okay, if you have a piece of software that you're going to be iterating on constantly, does it make sense to write a 30-page specification document that is then going to just change two weeks later? Of course not. That's ridiculous. This comes back to the idea that I mentioned in the last video that if you have a lot of requirements change, a lot of requirements velocity, you're going to be more agile. If you have no requirements change, no velocity, no 
you have it set up front, then you're going to be more plan driven. Only if you have requirements that are going to stand still, do you have the ability to do that documentation, to put the time into the documentation to those, those design documents, because you don't want to have to throw that away. So the agile idea is, okay, we know requirements are going to change. We know we're going to go back to Grandma Rachel and she's going to want something a little bit different. So we're going to not bother with doing huge documentation. We're still going to do some. It's, it's more informal. It's more note cardy. It's more back of the envelope whiteboard sort of design. And we will certainly talk about how to do this. But if we're doing that more informal process, then our documentation is the software. So there's more of a focus on self-documenting code, code where you do a better job at naming your variables, naming your methods, using frameworks to make it obvious how the flow of the software works, as opposed to having careful documentation that you wrote. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. I think this is more of a business argument in that in a plan-driven environment, Stereotypically, I mean, you, you'll have something like, uh, here are the requirements, and then we agree to pay X amount of money for X person hours, sign on the dotted line, here's what it is. In an agile world, it's more, okay, you know, you pay us X amount, we work as much as we can on the requirements that we have, we see where we get to, if that's good enough, then we're done. If it's not good enough, we you know, we work with the customer. Maybe we add on a, a few weeks and the customer pays a little bit more to add some more features they think of. And, you know, it, it, it is more a collaboration as to what makes the most sense monetarily. What can we build? How do we... You can see that there's the possibility of potentially ripping the customer off there. So there does need to be some formalization to what a person hour is and how much will get done. But in general, it's more around... Okay, we can put three weeks into it. Let's see where we go. That's right. And responding to change over following a plan. The stereotype is that in a plan-driven environment, you say, okay, this is our weekly schedule. This is exactly what we are going to do. When we hit week four, we are moving to this phase, and this is what's going to happen. And no, 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 no. That's the stereotype. Rational, I, I, I showed you in the previous video, has the mechanisms within it to do iteration within phases. But let's ignore reality for a moment and the stereotype saying that plan driven is very no we are going to do this then this then this then this because we are going to release in exactly one year in seven days this is exactly going to happen whereas agile is much more um the market has changed we need to change the software change the the need change etc 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 again in a plan driven environment if you're building airline software the air the, the new airplane will not change in six months so you're not responding to change in a plan-driven environment. You're in a plan-driven environment, you know what you're going to build because of hardware, because of customers, because of uh, uh, like approvals from FAA. It's not changing. Agile, it's probably changing. Agile is, oh, we're building this cool website. Holy smokes, did you see that? Someone released the same system just now, well, let's look at what they did and we got to top them. And it is much more of a dynamic or agile maneuver. So that's the basics of what we talk about when we talk about an agile process. Um, we just looked at that. Extreme programming is probably the most well-known of the agile process, or at least it was at the beginning. And extreme programming had the worst name it possibly could, XP, because XP, Extreme Programming, came out roughly the same time that Windows XP was released. Oops. Um, but regardless, uh, XP is not really a methodology. It's more a set of practices. And the idea is you adopt these practices to varying degrees depending on your environment, your team, your project. Remember, everything's on a continuum, from agile to plan-driven. Everything is on a continuum. You adopt some, you change some, you modify some. So XP as a methodology just kind of exists as the set of practices. The first is the planning game. We are going to do this as one of the guided practices in a couple of weeks, but the idea is that um, instead of a long and drawn-out requirements document, we are going to do a much more 
um, conversational, work with the customer, note cards passing back and forth to come up with what are the actual requirements of the system. But we will get to that later on. Whole team, or the idea of the on-site customer. If requirements have the ability to change, you need to have someone who has the authority to make that change and also to clarify any changes. So in an agile environment, ideally a, a stakeholder or a customer is a quote unquote part of the team. Um, they're co-located if possible. Um, they are someone you can call constantly and say, hey, what do you think about this? How does this work? Someone that has the ability to speak on behalf of the customers or the stakeholders. So you have to have that sort of feedback loop in order for the true nature of agility to work. Sustainable pace, um, a 40 hour work week. The, the theory here, which is borne out by reality, is that if you push developers too hard and they work beyond their capability, whatever that number is, we're, we're going with 40 here. If you, if you push them out too hard, then they're more likely to introduce bugs or defects into the software. They're more likely to make mistakes. Every mistake that you make then because, becomes a problem you have to fix later. So what happens is you may push an extra five hours, 10 hours out of a, of a person during a given work week, but because the quality of what they put out during that extra time is poor, you are now adding more time to the end of the project in order to correct the things that happened. So in, a, in XP, there is the notion that you actually are better off by keeping a sustainable pace of good quality development time rather than trying to do a, a crunch at the end to try and finish something off. Small releases is the idea that you always have a minimally viable product and it's something that you constantly are showing new versions to the customer so that they can give you that feedback. That's that type iteration loop that we're looking at. Coding standards, we want to follow whatever the accepted standards are in a, a programming language for the way you write variables, the way you write methods, the way you organize your code, so that anyone who is working on the code base can look at the code and can understand what's going on much easier. Um, there's another one, a, a, a slide ahead, um, that we'll get into this a little bit more, but we want it so that the code is effectively its own form of documentation. It is readable, it is understandable. Anyone who does development in this area can pick that up and figure out what's going on. Pair programming, one of my favorites, probably one of the more controversial ones, as weird as it might sound, the idea of two programmers working at the same computer, hopefully with two keyboards, two mice, two monitors. One person is the driver, one person is the navigator. So what's the theory behind this? Do you have another person there to say, hey, you missed that semicolon. Hey, you need to tab that in. Hey, you missed that curly bit. You would elbow that person in the face so fast it's not even funny. You don't care about that, right? That's why we use an IDE. An IDE is better at that anyway. An IDE is going to give you the, the code completion, give you those, those corrections. Those sorts of problems, we have tools to help with. The reason we have pair programming is basically for pair design. If two people are looking at some code and thinking, well, what's the best way to tackle this problem? And one person says, oh, I think it's a quadruple loop. And the second person goes, uh, can we talk about that? You know, <laughs> a quadruple loop is something you want to see, you know, a figure skater do, not something you want to see in your Python code. So it gives you the opportunity to discuss potential algorithms and design choices as you're coding as opposed to, hey, I'm gonna code it, hey, this didn't work, let me go bother someone and come back. What we find from the research is that people who do pair programming do take longer to create the code, but create uh, or generate fewer defects in the code, thus at the end of the day, saving time. So the idea is we're building better quality code up front, even though it takes longer, reducing the amount of time we have to spend in quality control later on. This is a hard sell for a lot of people, uh, mainly because the, the natural inclination is I want to divide my team so that everyone's working on something different and therefore parallelism, hooray, I'm building more stuff. But it, this is a cultural thing that it, it, it has to work in your company. Test-driven development is something that goes along with pair programming. It doesn't have to, but something where I've seen it. And I like to think of test-driven development as the dueling banjos of coding. 
Bing 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 So okay, that was silly, but what does that mean? Well, imagine you had two people doing pair programming, and one person says, I will write a test. Clack 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 clack. Ha ha! I bet you can't write code that passes this test. I bet I can. I have passed your test. And you go back and forth. You write the test first, then you write the code. Does this take longer? Potentially. What does it give you? An automatic test code base so you can always verify your code is working. Well, that's nice. Again, it's hard to convince people to do this. You, you typically are so focused on getting the functionality working. That's, that's that programmer, you know, kit that you need. Like, oh, I need to hit a button and watch the you know, screen do something neat. Not, I need to write a test case and watch a bar turn green. But... It does give you a code base uh, that is better tested and potentially, you know, is just higher quality in the end. But you have to, again, it's kind of a, a mentality. Refactor mercilessly. The idea that you can always go back in and make changes to the code. Refactoring is basically making corrections to the code for your own benefit. You find that quadruple loop and you go, I know a better way of doing that. And you change it, but it doesn't change the... It doesn't change the functionality of the code. It just makes it better. So you want to be able to re refactor. Collective code ownership. This goes back to what I was talking about with um, following standards. Um, in Agile, you want to be able to say that everyone has the ability to touch any piece of the system. Everyone owns all parts of the code. So that way you can move between aspects of the system. Everyone learns everything. You don't have that problem where, oh no, Susan's not in today. How are we ever going to build this piece of code? You know, it's, it's, you don't want that. Um, you want to have it to where, you know, you're moving, you know, Ahmed over to Susan's team or Susan's moving over to um, Alvaro's team that, that they all are going to be able to know what's going on because they've all had the ability to touch everyone's piece of code. Continuous integration is the idea that we, um, uh, always should have, we should have a system that's constantly building the code. So you write the code, um, it, it gets checked in, all the tests happen, and then you always have a working build. We are doing this. This is Travis. This is exactly what we're doing. Simple design, build the simplest thing that works. Great. Uh, metaphor over architecture. I hate this one. <laughs> um, mainly because it doesn't, I mean, the idea is, can you come up with a cute metaphor to explain your software to someone else? If the answer is yes, then great. Yeah. There is an unofficial 13th practice, which is the idea of the stand-up meeting. The idea of the stand-up meeting is every day uh, when you get into the, the office, the virtual office, the Zoom meeting, the Slack channel, whatever it might be, uh, everyone takes a moment to stand up and talk about what have I accomplished, what am I going to accomplish, and what are my blockers. Um, the reason you stand up is hopefully so that people don't talk about what donuts they brought in or how awesome the game was last night or when are we going to have that Fall Guys tournament or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. Uh, standing up forces people to get to the point and get moving. So we do call it a stand-up meeting. Now, Scrum is another Agile methodology that is probably the most popular Agile methodology currently. It has aspects of XP in it, and it, 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 there's similar feel to it, but Scrum has more of a process. So if XP is pure Agile sounds strong, but it, it really does push harder to Agile, Scrum adds some more plan-driven aspects to it, so you have more structure. So it, it is applicable for any sort of project you're working on. It's the idea of iteration and... Um, uh, feedback from the customer and trying to always have something that's ready to go. Um, the quick version, actually, uh, I'll let you come back and read this when you look at the the slides on your own. I think it's easier to just talk about it on this on this page right here on this slide. So Scrum works by having a product backlog. So you do the the user stories, you do some sort of planning game, you figure out what the customer needs, and it goes into a giant list Excel document. Uh, team city piece of stuff, wherever you're going to keep your, your requirements. Again, this is dependent on your team. At the beginning of every sprint, the scrum master, which sounds intense, but project lead, lead developer, however you want to think about it, 
um, you, you figure out what you're going to do during that sprint. Well, what's a sprint? A sprint is a dedicated amount of time that you say, I'm going to work on these features. I'm going to work on, th this is our, 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 our checkpoint to checkpoint. Here's what we're going to work on. A typical sprint time frame is two weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks. Four weeks is pushing it, in my opinion. We're going to do two weeks in class, mostly. Um, there'll, there'll be a few exceptions. But over two weeks, what, what can you get done? So you have a nice targeted time window. You look at the product backlog and you look at the top and you see, well, what are the highest priority requirements right now? The highest priority features. So you figure those out and what you need to do them. And you look at the difficulty of them and you say, okay, I think we can do the first two, maybe first three. We're going to put those in the sprint backlog. So then during the sprint, individuals are assigned to various tasks. During the stand-up meeting, the daily scrum meeting, as it's called here in, the, in this loop-de-loop, -loop, uh, you review where are we at on all of these tasks? How is everyone doing? What are the blockers? Do we need to reassign tasks? Okay, great. Go, you know, go team, go. Woo! And you break up. You go do, you, do your stuff. And you keep going around and around and around and around until the sprint is done. Now, at the end of the sprint, what's happened? Well, you either finished or did not finish those features. If you finished all the features, you might have gone back to the product backlog and pulled another feature. Um, if you didn't finish a feature, there might have been a reason for that. You had to spend more time on research. Maybe you had to find a new library. Maybe you had to go back to the customer and ask how they wanted something done. So you review. How did we do? Well, it looks like we were able to accomplish this much work. Okay. During the next sprint, we know that um, we know that uh, Manuel and Judy are going to be uh, gone for a week. They've got a, they got a vacation coming up. Uh, we know Adrian is is going to be busy, but we know that um, Sarah and Alvaro are coming back from their from their conference, so they'll have more time. Okay, so I think we can accomplish maybe this much work. And we're going to talk about how to measure that work when we get to requirements. But you pick out how much work you think you can do during the next sprint. During that sprint review, you say, this is how it worked. Great. You go back to the sprint planning, pick off the new features, go back in, and you do it again. And at the end of every sprint, you should have something, according to that box at the end, something that works, something that runs, something that is a minimally viable product, something you can show to the customer. And you keep iterating. And maybe you have enough money, time, resources to do seven iterations, 12 iterations, whatever it might be. Maybe um, you've been hired just to do a quick prototype and you are given two iterations, two sprints. It's incredibly flexible. You have that backlog, you pull off features for each sprint, you work on those features, you review how you did, you use that information to guide the next sprint and you keep going over and over and over. So. Back to the, the slide before this, uh, this is the text that just explained what I was talking about during uh, that document. So uh, you can find these slides, of course, uh, on the, the lecture notes at cs3240.cs.virginia.edu, um, and you can come back and see it there. Um, so once you have that uh, product backlog, you can actually track how you're doing by build, building something called a burn down chart. And the burn down chart looks like a, just a graph that just kind of does this and shows how you are, um, you are working through each of the features as you go through. The Scrum Master keeps an eye on that um, and manages the burndown chart, manages the backlog, checks in with the, with the developers, see how they're doing. And then uh, they also check in with the product owner. Uh, the product owner could be the onsite customer. It could be someone in management. It could be whoever's the representative of the stakeholders that can make decisions about the direction of the project and where it needs to go. So we are going to use a modified version of Scrum in our project. We are going to do requirements based on the projects that you pick. You are going to create a product backlog um, that you will then pull features off of for each sprint. We'll have some, we'll have some um, requirements. Let's not overload that term. We will have some limitations as to what you can and can't do on a given sprint. Like for instance, you have to do login at a certain point so that we can check it off. Um, but you will pick those features. Your team will work on them during those, um, those two weeks. You'll meet with your TA at the end of two weeks and you'll have a sprint check. And that sprint check is an opportunity for the TAs to make sure you're making good progress and to make sure your project is, is going well 
and for you to then pick off the next features for the next sprint. And that's how we're going to go week by week by week. Uh, that's how the, the, the course is going to run. So um, that's agile. Um, hopefully that, that helps. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, exactly how do you choose agile versus plan driven. It's going to be the subject of the guided practice um, during, during the week. So uh, that video actually might fall. Well, I'll probably do a short video uh, uh, of it regardless so that you can see it ahead of doing the guided practice. So there you go. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for hanging out here at beautiful downtown mall in, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. See you next time. Bye.